Stop talk about book. Book good. Read books. Shut up. Moving on, book ogre. <laughs> Welcome to Science Fiction and Fantasy Read Along. I am ATN. This is DM Phil. Hey, everybody. I'm Yule. Today, we will be discussing Chapter 5 of Gardens of the Moon by Steven Erickson, our first chapter set in the city of Darujistan. In the previous episode, Captain Gano's Perrin, recently attached to the bridge burners, was murdered and brought back to life. The Hound of Shadow, known as Gear, discovered the location of the interloper Hairlock, and the vastly depleted bridge burners had departed for Darujistan without their new captain on a seemingly impossible mission. This chapter, which is blessedly short, introduces an entirely new set of characters and to add to the confusion, a completely new calendar. The calendars are running in parallel. That's the most important thing to remember. And Pale fell to the Malazans two days ago from where we are in the story. Just understand things here are uh, different. That's the main takeaway there. Are you guys ready to begin? Yeah. Yeah, let's do it. Let's rock. Did you guys read the poems at the beginning of the chapter? Of course. Yeah, one was about Crocus, one was about Crop. I know that there was mention of a hanged man in the second one. Yes. That's the one that I thought was about Crop. And the first one had references to sailing, and, and they said something about a lake, and I'm sure they're referring to Lake Azure. Well, like the first time I read those pieces, I was I, very little of it was remotely clear, right? And then after reading the chapter, you can go back and you can see a little bit more. Yeah. But they're still very unclear, right? As the people that we're following are on their way to Darujistan, maybe that's what the first poem is about. I have no idea, man. Right, well, we'll and I don't remember. That. That's, that's, uh, I mean, that's definitely yeah, I don't part either. of it. I have no memory of these. Before we, before we actually start, where are we? Darujistan. Well, like on the planet? Yeah, where is Darujistan? Darujistan is to the south of Pale. I'm not sure exactly how far it is, but there's a giant lake in between Pale and Darujistan. Lake Azure. And I'm not sure how it is by walking, but it seems like it's not very far because somewhere in the story they talk about how the smoke of Pale is, is in the... Invisible. That only happened two days away, so... Well, I will remind you of how far the smoke traveled in california when there were the wildfires up in the north you could see the smoke all the way in la who knows right depending on which way it's so if going. the if the map is even remotely to scale which i expect it's it's approximate it's not really to scale it's about 900 miles what it's not that far really i mean well i mean smoke depending. on the wind right yeah exactly wait there's no way that no it's not 900 miles no way why it's 860 if you if you make the approximation. Well, that's not a lake. That's a sea. The lake is only about 300 miles across at its shortest, right? It is. It's been, essentially, it's an inland sea. It's probably just fresh water. This, this doesn't matter. <laughs> it's about 860 miles south of Pale. So that's where we are. Y'all. Yeah. Conflicted, a portly gentleman dreams of escaping the doomed city, Darujistan. Well, that's the saint. Okay, so... Why would Krupp dream of leaving Darujistan? Well, they're about to be taken over by the Malazans. I would say that's reasonable expectation, yeah. Krupp is leaving town at the beginning of his dream. I mean, he goes through the city itself. He's on this, like, personal dream journey, and there's a lot of symbolism in there that I haven't quite worked out yet, and we can talk about it. But he's leaving Darujistan in his dream. It's not really important the direction that he goes. is I don't, I don't think really... But he talks in a very peculiar way, and his choice of describing things is very, let's call it not standard language. He describes it in a very poetic, eloquent, uh, descriptive way that's, that most people would, don't talk like that. Almost nobody refers to themselves in the third person. Well, then there's that part, yes. And he's like, Krupp is wise. So one of the things I wanted to say, since we're talking about him leaving Darujistan, there's a moment where he sees basically bums, <laughs> old men. They're lepers. They're lepers. Yeah, exactly. Then he passes some women who are garbed in the same fashion, but they're dunking cats. And Krupp thinks to himself, that's odd. I don't know what that significance of this is. And then he didn't really care in the end. What was that all about? I wrote a note and, I, and my note is, I don't get it. <laughs> I get it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Are they like plague carriers? If you go to a dream dictionary and you look up drowning cats, 
essentially that means your independence is being impinged upon by mm -hmm. someone or some several someone's being dependent upon you which is true we know there's symbolism there because Krupp acknowledges that there's symbolism there and he just doesn't care to think about it. You get the impression fairly quickly that Krupp is not all there upstairs. He's a little off, and you're still trying to figure out how off he is or why he is. Well, I would to, to second the idea that he's not really all there, he often will have moments where he uh, envisions something uh, about himself, and then gives a rationalization why that's not important to the situation that he's in. What are you talking about? He starts thinking about youth. It also, I think, kind of connects to what you're saying as far as uh, people that, who are dependent on him. Because we, we'll see that later on in the story. Then he, like, questions whether or not, like, who, who, who even mentioned youth? So okay. he's, like, thinking this whole thing about youth. Yeah. And okay. how there's somebody, in, you know, in danger that, you know, Krupp has to be there for. And then he's like, well, who mentioned that anyway? When I first read that, I thought maybe he meant like Geno's Perrin, but he, that, I figured out it's not who he meant at all, right? Why right. would he know who Geno's is? Here's why there's a little uh, ambiguity there when you first read it. It's because right before that, it says that um, uh, Krupp has considered himself a diviner. He's a person that can read the future. And he has this raw talent. And he said, unlike everybody else who can read the portents of the future by like tossing the knuckle bones or reading the heat fractures of scapulae or using the deck of dragons. He said Krupp has it in his head all the time, constantly. I mean, who do you think he was talking about then? Why is this, well, why I, did this influence the way you were thinking? Well, I had no idea whatsoever because at, when you first start the story, the only young person you know in any of the stories the only young man you know any of the stories is... Young man? All right. Did it say man? No. It just says young person. Okay. Youth. Yeah. Okay, it says youth. youth. The only two young people you really know are Gano's parent and... Sorry. Girl. Yep. Later on in the story, next section actually in the, of the chapter, you meet another young person. So the, it, it's true, but he does talk about the, the, the coin drops. Mm -hmm. And that happens to a specific person later yeah. in the story right. who's young. So... But who spoke of coins? Yes, exactly. Ooh. So that's like twice he did that also. There's yeah. more than two, actually. Yes, 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 yes. There's four times when he essentially tries to deny what's going on. Like when he's leaving town, he's saying, isn't it better to save your own skin? Yes, that's a wise action to do. Krupp is wise, good. He's denying the divination. He's denying the, the mention of youth. He denies the mention of the coin. He denies the, essentially that he has responsibility for the people of Darujistan. He's trying to get out of an obligation that he does not want. He knows that Darujistan's in trouble and he doesn't really want the burden. Right. And he thinks the people of Darujistan are lepers. And like, are lepers worth saving? Interesting. No, they're not worth saving. They're lepers, but that's what the people are. And then they're dunking the cats. The lady lepers are dunking the cats, and he's, he views them as a burden. He doesn't want to have to save them, but he has to save them. It's mm -hmm. his city. So he's trying to come to terms with this. That's the whole point of his dream. But in the end, he doesn't get to leave town, leave town. He gets to go to a crossroads. Yeah, because it's like uh, going to storm soon, so he finds an inn. Well, well, what's a crossroad, it, first of all? It's, a, it's, it's perfect symbolism for I have a choice to make in my life. You cannot pass that point without it. You have to decide. There's an important point here when he comes to that crossroads. Two things. One, there's right next to the crossroads, there's this inn, and it's at the top of this hill. And he's like, who put an inn at the top of a hill? And it kind of bugs him. And then, then there's this tree right there. And inside this tree, there's this swinging thing. Uh, uh, tied up in burlap and he doesn't describe it you don't have any idea what it means but it certainly sounds important i had a pretty good idea of what it meant i had no idea what it meant because <clears throat> he's in a dream it could mean anything when he said there was a long shape wrapped in burlap hanging from a tree you didn't think of a person being hung well i assumed it was a person well what would it mean to have a hanged person marking a crossroads i have no idea don't go any further or you're hung no matter which way you go 
<laughs> or if you don't make a choice, you're hung. Who knows? I don't know what it means. And there may be more symbolism and meaning in there than I got by the time I read the end of this section. Like other sections that we've read, I'm sure we'll miss things. That's okay, though. It's good to miss. It's good to miss things. It's also good to catch stuff. It's fun, right? It's a puzzle. This dream is a puzzle. The whole thing is a puzzle. Well, okay, so Krupp is performing a divination in his head, correct? Right. <laughs> yes, there's that's, dream. That's what the dream is. It's him performing divination. We've encountered the youth, and we've encountered the coin, and we know that he feels that he's burdened, and that's kind of where we're left when he arrives at the end, huffing and puffing, because it's at the top of a hill, just past, just past the crossroads. And apparently this is an inn that's been broken down and shut down for a very, very long time. And that's symbolic also, meaning that Krupp has never come here before. No one has come here before. And yet this is a recurring dream. Well, he goes in thinking that he's going to order up a banquet. <laughs> yeah. He was even like talking about it on his way up the hill until he couldn't like talk anymore because he's he was gasping. <laughs> so yeah, I think Krupp is a pretty, pretty heavy dude. And uh, he's gluttonous and he's really ready to come in and just like order up the whole bar and make sure everybody's well taken care of. And it's basically one candle and a whole bunch of uh, uh, undesirables are huddled around. It. They're literally described as beggars. Yeah. Six. There were only six. All right. Well, and they're around a tallow candle. You guys remember tallow candles? Sure thing. Oh, spirits. But eh, coincidence. <laughs> Nothing is coincidental <laughs> in these books. So yeah, and then there's this one of these uh, beggars. What do they refer to him as? He's the mouthpiece of these people, basically. There's one beggar that He's is the attended. spokesman. No, the spokesman, exactly. And he is there and has all the conversation with Krupp going forward. I think it's important to separate right now, just to make things a little more clear moving ahead. These beggars are aspects of Krupp's personality. Mm -hmm. are they I, well, I believe they are yeah i believe they are too and that's he like and says it yeah they're asked but but you're not sure which it is but the point is they're starving they're beggars they've been locked up in this inn for forever which means krupp has not given them any attention in his own personal life they're aspects of his personality and we'll, we'll get to that towards the end but um, he's going to, what, break bread with them? Yeah, since they have nothing, he's going to uh, share with them. And he pulls out, like, a bread from his sleeves. And, oh, and, and cheese, moldy cheese, which is important. Well, he doesn't know it's moldy right away. That's true. He offers it to them, and they're hungry. And then he notices that it's moldy. And then he says beggars can't be choosers when it comes to cheese. <laughs> There's a part in there that says... It ever pleases us when we taste your particular flavor, Krupp of Darugistan, implying they might not be his. And also, or, they granted him an audience. I mean, if we're going to mm -hmm. confuse the matter, uh, the very top of page 136, it says, one of the fellows nodded. We will grant your audience, hapless one. And always we are pleased at your traveling appetites. I'm still under the opinion that in Krupp's mind, he's partially insane, and his method of coping with that is to create multiple personalities within his own mind to help keep them all straight. So in a way, they're foreign and separate, but they're also part of him. They're distinct personalities, but not distinct entities. I, you know, that's what I got out of it. I can understand why you got that out of it. I wonder, however, if they're not just entertaining his sort of arrogance. Maybe, but Krupp himself acknowledges that he doesn't know who they are. He always thought they were his hungers. Right. That's hungers with a capital H. There was only one that was not capitalized, and I believe that was Virtues. I actually tried to deal them all. It was and like hungers, doubts, gifts, and virtues, all of which were capitalized. Four, four different, oh, and humility. Oh, well, no, no, humility was an individual. This one's not capitalized. Right. right. I, think it was seven. A, I think it was a typo. But I did notice. Yeah, so yeah, so. he's sort of figured out whether they're gifts, virtues, doubts, or hungers. Like if this is um, a reading from the deck of dragons, essentially. Yeah, it feels a lot like it. Yeah, it's done, it's done in corrupt style. Like, like I said before, everything here is different. The, the way that the names are revealed, like Krupp's name is revealed to us in a way that's not normal. It wasn't revealed in dialogue. The calendar is different. 
And now we're, we're seeing a different type of divination. When Krupp is doing divination, like who gives him the information? What is he divining? Like when you're reading from the deck of dragons, who's involved? Like we said, he is, tr he's at a crossroads in his life and he wants to know where he is supposed to go. And these virtues, doubts, hungers, whatever, are basically saying, hey, you've got business still where you come from. Isn't this what you really want to do? And he tries to, like you said, ignore this through many different rationalizations on why he should leave. But in the end, he's like, no, I love this place. What, what do they call it? What do they call Darujistan? The Jeweled City. Oh, this wondrous fiery gem that is Darujistan is home to Krupp. And that is as it should be. Right. That's fair enough. But how does he divine? He implies that it's in his head constantly. Yeah, but I mean, is he just a deity? Where does he get his information? Well, right? it's, it's, it's innate. That's what... That's fine. Fiddler has an innate talent, if we recall. Well, he does have an innate, you're right. He has an innate natural talent, but it's not Fiddler. It's like he's getting a gift somehow, right? It's mm -hmm. a gift. Is it possible that these, these people are not like inside Krupp's head? All right, so if that's the case, then is the god that is being, or the ascended person that is out there? Or several. Or several. Are we talking about Opon? Because it wouldn't be Opon. The coin is mentioned a lot in here. The coin is mentioned a lot, but this is not Opon. All right, it's either probably somebody we haven't met, or it is Krupp. It's his different incarnations in his set. So I agree with Philip. Like I, we've talked about this, and so I was thinking about it. But then there are certain things in the reading that bothered me about it. And when they said that they would entertain him. They would allow him to have an audience. That to me suggested that they're, they're amused by his presence. And then they said they always enjoyed his particular flavor, meaning that they've had other flavors. Sure. So I'm, I'm a little suspicious that they're not inside Krupp's head. They're there, yes, but I... So what you're saying is the table, the cards... Those are all part of Krupp, but just like Tattersail, when she is doing the Deck of Dragons, she felt a presence come in at the same time. Right. Maybe that doesn't happen all the time, but maybe that's what's going on here, is what I'm, you're saying? I'm a little suspicious. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, Philip okay. could be completely accurate, and I could be off the mark completely. I'm suspicious because of those things I told you. Well, also because like one of the speakers, I mean, Krupp does not fully comprehend who they are. And they're not telling. And they're not telling either. They're even coy about it. They say, perhaps we are your doubts. Mm -hmm. Hmm. What about um, at the end of uh, the conversation, they're all very well fed and they look healthy. Yeah, they look healthier. Well, there's that, that's because there's symbolism there. Krupp decided to feed them. And as they grew healthy, they grew lifeful, they grew stronger. And that's where I, my feeling is these are, these are his virtues. And because, again, it says a little bit earlier where the spokesman says, perhaps we are your gifts then, wasting away, as it were. <laughs> but I, I think Krupp, whether they intend it or not, they encourage Krupp to be virtuous, to do the right thing, to, to be a hero. They pointedly ask him if he is going to return to Darujistan. And Krupp responds, of course. He merely stepped out for a breath of night air so that he could, you know, get his wits about him. That's yeah. basically what he's looking at this whole thing as him stepping out so that he can get a little clearer perspective on what he's going to do. Okay, so he came to the crossroads and he made his decision. Who's the hanged man? Suggesting that these are all aspects of Krupp. Yeah. They say that he is, oh, his humility, yeah. But Krupp, <laughs> in a way that he does, he's able to work his way around it and basically says, I have no humility. So that can't be what you are. <laughs> he says, and he's like so non-humble, he's actually tied him to a sack and hung it from a tree in the, in the middle of nowhere. Very entertaining. I mean, at first I really didn't like this character. Anybody that spoke... Of, of themselves in the third person it's weird i'm yeah. not a big fan of yeah so i there is one part i want to go back to when he was talking to the spokesperson and he said the coin spins krupp still spins and krupp says 
Krupp hears it, he cannot help but hear it. An endless ringing that sings in the head. For all Krupp has seen, for all that he suspects to be, he is just Krupp, a man who would challenge the gods in their own game. That is so powerful. That means Krupp is challenging them. Shall Krupp accept this challenge then? What are the gods, after all, if not the perfect victims for Krupp, whose sleight of hand is matched only by his sleight of mind? Perfect victims of confidence, claims Krupp. To me, that implies like Krupp is like a major player that nobody knows about, but only because he can hear these things. Was it not in the very beginning of the section where Krupp's intelligence was described as surpassing that of almost anybody? Well, sure, he's smart. No, he's not smart. He's like a genius of unparalleled intellect. Was he describing himself that way? I think so. Well, that's Krupp. He has no humility. He has no humility, but is he wrong? I don't know. Is it, is it vast intelligence or is it his ability to see the future? What is he seeing? What's this future that he's seen? He if can, this is his form of divination, what is he seeing? He can hear the coin. Right? Okay. He said he can see the youth, right? He can hear the coin falling. He's like, it falls now. This yes. very night. So he knows that there are ascendants tinkering and he's going to go get involved. And he's going to save Darujistan. In a youth. He knows he can leave and probably save his own skin, but he also knows he has a chance to beat the gods at their own game. Is he's that- stepping up to a challenge, right? But was he ever really going to leave? This is his city. This portion of the chapter reticulates back and forth between two characters. In an effort to add to clarity, we have removed this reticulation, thereby following one character all the way through until the reticulation ends within the chapter. Rooftop Darujistan at night. A young thief witnesses first blood in a war among assassins. Let's just talk about Crocus leaping on the uh, rooftops. We're above a city. It is, there's so many rooftops that you can't see the ground. The city at night is lit up by gas lamps. It's a super cool, colorful detail. And it literally is colorful. Blue and green lights. They don't talk about how where exactly it comes from other than like big caverns and there's this group of people called the gray faces that dedicate their lives to keeping it going for the last 900 years but they it's huge it's vast and it's like ultra ultra cramped and it's a 2000 year old city we are following crocus who's a thief and he is on a mission to go thieving he is hopping from uh, rooftop to rooftop till he gets to the the Arl estate. Does he have a specific room that he was going for? He had a specific target and he figures out the room through logic. The room that he's looking for is one of the daughters of the Darl. It's the youngest daughter of the family. And she's recently come of age. She's the fairest daughter as well. And she has been lavished with expensive gifts and jewels and baubles by suitors. And he's heard the stories, and he's been real quiet about hearing those stories, but he's real interested. And here he is, having heard those stories, looking to make a little bit of money. And so he finds a room, and he starts taking stuff. He took his time, did you notice? Uh, Yeah, uh, it's very well written. It is, it (laughs) is. As far as how much effort and all the implements that Crocus has taken along with him in order to be able to get into this situation. Case in point, uh, he has black pitch on his foot. On his toes. On his toes. Yeah. So that what, he can grip better, I'm assuming, as he's yeah. climbing the estate? Exactly. Uh, he's overhead. He's skipping guards. He's silent. It's stated that he is very quiet. He doesn't make a sound as he's going. He has tools that he has borrowed from his grand or his uncle. Uncle Mammoth. Uh, who also lets us in on a little bit of information about how the ruling class is dealing with the Malazans actually invading or <laughs> potential invasion of Darujistan. Yes. And uh, we can get on that in a second. But he has been able to borrow a very special tool from his uh, uncle and is able to like cut cut his way into a lock situation through three locks i believe it was and he didn't really borrow it he kind of stole it i'm pretty sure his uncle has no uh, idea uncle can't remember where he puts everything all the time so you know it it works for all of us (laughs) better buy another one as he's stealing everything and, and is going to leave he ends up deciding that he wants to keep something for himself and he takes a turban 
and it's like jeweled and it's really nice looking. And I don't know why somebody wants to steal a turban, but yeah, I don't know. It sounded pretty corny to me. It was like sky blue silk with golden braided thread. I mean, who are you selling that to? Anybody that's not buy selling it, it to everybody. Had it. Well, he wants to make money off of this. No, thing, he right? said he was keeping it for himself. Yeah, I see what you're saying. I see, I see, I see. Well, uh, he assumes that this was something that was going to be used for an upcoming party that is going to be happening later on in the in the book also. As he's leaving, he catches a peek of the woman sleeping in the bed. And even though Crocus is 17 years old, it explicitly states that he has seen whores, all sorts of manners of prostitute and whatnot. <laughs> what is a whore? Even though he's seen many naked people, he admires what he's seen. And then he leaves. Well, well, he does. And just so my two bits on this, just to emphasize what you said, you all so awesomely, is that like my dream job growing up was to be like a thief for a living. <laughs> And so when I read this piece, I'm like, oh my gosh, this kid is amazing. I mean, he's 17. He's not really a kid. He's a young man, but he has the skills, the temerity, the nerve. He has the patience. At the very end, he saw this girl. And it, again, it's, he went into meticulous descriptions over every move and everything he saw and his thoughts and his evaluation of the room. Way more detail than you would give such as he quickly got down to the balcony or some nonsense like that. I mean, it really meticulously went into detail on how he did everything and exactly what he saw and what his thoughts were in interpretation. I love this scene. I thought it was fascinating. And all I could think about it was like, this guy, Steven Erickson, he, like, he wanted to be a thief at some point in his life. <laughs> he probably played several thieves in um, GURPS. When I read this scene, that's exactly what I was thinking. And if you've ever read like a lot of rogues and other books, they skip over stuff, they gloss over a lot of aspects, but every single element of this scene was realistic. And fairly quickly conveyed to us as well. It wasn't like he spent a million words to convey the idea. We got it pretty quick. He doesn't drone on and on about ridiculous details. I hate that in writing. He's very efficient. Yes. So I really value this scene. And at the very end, when he saw this beautiful woman, he swears to the queen of dreams that she's so beautiful. But then he just shrugs and moves on. And, th and this is important because he maintained his professionalism and walked away, regardless of what he felt personally. I think that's an amazing part. It, it, was, it wasn't emphasized, but I think a little element was very important is that he walked out What's the alternative? Yeah, I was going to say. Well, when you're a... <laughs> well, the point is when you're 17 years old and you see a half-naked girl, if you were like me, I don't know what I would have done, you know? Right, moving on. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so he's leaving with a small fortune in a bag under his belt. And then as he's belt. yeah, and then as he's on the rooftops exiting, he notices this is where we see the smoke coming from Pale. Yeah. At first he thinks, oh, it's just clouds in the sky, but then he realizes it's smoke. Yep. And that's where we get a little information about Uncle Mamet actually having conversation with people that matter. And it's because of that that we know that Crocus knows. It's a funny quote. Oh, so, read it. Yeah, Please read, read it because it, it's hilarious. Uh, Darujistan's army is a contemptible handful of noble sons who do nothing but strut back and forth on Whore Street gripping their jeweled swords <laughs> it's hilarious man it's like, like monty python <laughs> it's just ridiculous <laughs> there's a street called horror street that's right and, and i can uh, see these guys doing the ministry of silly walks holding on to jeweled swords <laughs> too you know it's just ridiculous it's, it's like the shoes that are like way too big you know funny very funny and this so, is also the same the same moment when we find out that the calendars are parallel that it was two days ago that Pale fell. Sure thing. So Crocus takes his ill-gotten goods and uh, bids farewell to the fair maiden and gets back up on the roof to take off. We're going to leave him at Kroll's Belfry. C who's Kroll? Uh, you know, I'm not really sure who Kroll is. I, I I vaguely know they describe him. It says Kroll's Temple, right? Yeah, Kroll's Temple. They, but they said the last monk who honored that god died like generations ago or something. Yeah, and yet the temple's still there, so, unoccupied. So an edifice to some ancient deity that nobody cares about anymore or is dead. It predated the city, I believe. 
whoa, really? That, I mean, isn't that in there? Or am I imagining things? I might have skipped it over as a superfluous detail, which I love and slap me for that. It describes Kroll as an eldering god. Kroll Temple is on Kroll Avenue. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's kind of the top of the nobles quarter. Is that kind of correct? It's up there. Yeah. Well, we're, we're real close to the Darl Estate, right? Which is in the high part of the city. Well, let's just look at the map. The Kroll is in the very center of the estate district. Wow. So that guy doesn't really go far. Oh, he goes back to where he came from. Yeah, he does. Okay, so uh, it's at Kroll's Temple where the scene has kind of shifted. The way the book is written, there's some interspersing scenes where we're actually following an assassin whose name is Talo. Talo Prefar. Uh, who had just recently been shot by an arrow in his shoulder. And it took him a while to realize that, oh my goodness, I'm being hunted. At this point, he's convinced that somebody has launched an assassin war. He's trying to get back to his clan. but He thinks it's pretty mundane, though. He asks himself the question, what clan leader would dare challenge Vorkin's rule? Right, Vorkin must be the head of the guild. Talo is just on the rooftops observing and making sure everything is going according to plan but he doesn't have he's not out to kill anybody no he's roaming right now his job right. right now is to just be like a cop essentially on the rooftops let's talk about the rooftops let's emphasize the entire thing the council rules by day the assassins rule by night yeah they uh anytime there's uh problems that need to be settled at night it's the assassins that are doing it right but there's a whole world on top of these roofs and it's like a highway like people travel across them all over them and this guy is up on the roofs making sure that everything is going according to plan and nothing's out of the, out of the normal. Well, I, I think part of that is, like you said, being a cop. I mean, in, in their- patrolling. Well, yeah, but what is he patrolling for? They don't say, but it, it's kind of implied that, yeah, maybe an occasional thief, but I, I think they rough up or frighten or kick off anybody that should not be up there. <laughs> So basically, thieves not in a guild, uh, assassins working without permission, maybe that kind of thing. Well, that's part of it. I, I just think that no, even your common bystander, a common bystander gets up there and they throw them off to make a point. This right. is our th no, this is our turf. Don't ever come up here again at night. I that's the kind of feeling I got. I mean, because there was no guild war going on. He's just a roamer there to to enforce his the territory of the assassin. They sit in there. It's like, ah, oh, maybe you'll see a couple rogue thieves or something like that. Obviously, he's not worried about those people because they're kind of like brothers of a different cloth, but still creatures of the night kind of thing. They have business up there. Yeah, they have business up there. The people if you that, don't, then you got to go. Yeah. And he's up there to enforce that. You got to go business. Yeah, that's what I think. And probably to just observe as well, to see. Like, to be a pair of eyes up there, to get word back, etc. Like, you, you have to have these people. Yeah, so I, I, they don't really explain it, but I think the guild structure, structure is there's some person named Vorkon who rules over all the assassin guilds, but the guild itself is made up of different clans of mutually aligned assassins. Maybe friends, contemporaries, I don't know. Probably similar to cells, right? Yeah, that might be a good, act, good description. Well, okay, so great. This guy... Is up on the belfry. What what's going on? Well, he uh, is hoping to lay an ambush for th his attacker. Yeah, because from the belfry you can see every in every direction. Going up there, he uh, has expended a lot of energy. He's and blood. Uh, lost a lot of blood. He is cold and sweating, and he actually passes out for a short time. And then when he gets up, he looks over and sees a silhouette. And he's ready to take aim. He's like, ha ha, I got you. I got this guy. And uh, he fires. So he's shooting down a little bit because he's at high ground. At a silhouette. So he doesn't know who he's really, truly shooting at. And it just happens to be at the same time. Oh, that's Crocus. No, he's that's about Crocus. to shoot Crocus. Yeah, he's an assassin. This is incredible. And he's just like aiming on this kid. And there's like no way this kid's going to survive, right? No way at all. And uh, Crocus hears something very loud, if, I'm, if I remember. Yeah, correctly. no, it was really loud. And what he heard was a coin. And being the natural thief that he is, he jumps down to get it. It's so funny. 
He like yeah. clobbers it with both hands. <laughs> I was surprised he didn't catch it with the turban or something like well, that. <laughs> I think you guys took it the wrong way. He was trying to be quiet and the coin made noise and he was trying to steal the coin. It's not because he was greedy. All right. Well, that might be true. But uh, either maybe way, both. mother. <laughs> it, it said with instinct. Like he, he pounced on it with instinct and I just thought it was amusing. Now, the instinct of a rogue who's trying to be stealthy. Sure. Okay. That's sure. Fine. He hears about 20 feet past his head uh, the shatter of uh, like a ceramic tile or something. Yeah, a roof tile. Roof. Yeah. And it takes him only a moment, but he realizes, oh, damn. Somebody took a pot shot at him. Yeah. And then he uh, turns around, and then from Tala's perspective, two blades come in and stab him up. Hold on. Go back just a oh, little sorry. bit. Because he took that pot shot at Crocus. And Crocus ducked accidentally because he heard that coin. That is when Tallow, his spine kind of tingles and his sense of preservation like kicks in for the very last time. And he turns around and there's another assassin with his arms raised and who sinks his daggers into his chest and kills him. That's right. And I, and I want to, if for anybody not paying attention, a coin <laughs> fell and uh, caused Crocus to want to bend over and pick it up for whatever reason. Okay, so let's go real quick. Just Back let's just be dream. real obvious about it. This is exactly what Krupp was talking about in his dream. Right. The this coin the... falling at the feet of a youth. But who talked of youth? Nobody. Well, about? surely it wasn't Krupp. Right, exactly. He's innocent. So the assassin is dead. The person who tried to shoot Crocus is now dead. Tallow is dead. And uh Crocus sees this, and the person who did the killing of Tallow sees Crocus. Yeah. And Crocus is like, I'm out of here. Gotta go. And this is where you find out that the city also has these, it's called Monkey Lane. Oh, that's it's so good. It's an avenue where there are uh, hemp clotheslines bridging the gaps of the different roofs, but there are also steel cables within those that are also used to... Some of them are just hemp lines to hang clothes, but right. some of them were placed by thieves for the express purpose of using them to navigate the city. Yes, I think you said wire, but it's the same difference. It's wire wrapped with cloth so that you think it's hemp. Oh, I see. Yes, yes. It's enough to support their weight, and they know that. Guys, I cannot say enough. This is the most incredible scene of the entire book so far. I'm seriously jived about it. It's very exciting. I mean, the way it's written, because there are the different passages, we see a little crocus, we see a little tallow, we see a little crocus, we see a little tallow. We don't realize that they're meeting up, and when they finally do, it's fantastic. And now, crocus is on the run for his life because there's not one assassin, there's not two assassins, but we're introduced to a third assassin who's the leader of these two guys, and they are all after Crocus. Okay, that is true. Crocus only sees one, though, and he runs for his life, and the one has two daggers. He runs for his life, jumps off the roof, does all sorts of stuff, ends up getting chased by a second one that has a crossbow. So crossbow is actually number one. And then when, like, when, when Erickson's referring to them, he refers to them as the first assassin or the, whatever, and the second assassin. And then eventually we get to the third assassin, right? The commander. And the thing about these ATN, if I can really quickly, is that they are speaking spells of magic. They're floating down from the, from the rooftops to the ground. Crocus just like sees this guy floating down. He runs and he like j leaps off this building, grabs Grabs the guy wider, basically ping pongs his way down, falls down, and then keeps running. And he's like, oh, crap, they have magic. Yeah, and, and the reason why he uh, falls down is because he is in mid-swing <laughs> between buildings when he realizes that one of them is aimed with the crossbow, I guess, yeah. number one. You refer to it as an antique crossbow, I believe? Yeah, I think it was something like that. Pretty and interesting. And uh, instead of taking being shot, Crocus lets go. Yeah, he did. And he does like in a scene of a movie where he goes and he hits a cross, or he has say a line of clothing, and then it breaks, and then he hits another one, and it breaks, and then yeah. like you said, Philip, he's on the ground and he's running again. Well, he he rolls out of it and bangs his head on the wall. It's kind of hilarious. Now there's um, a few instances as he's running from these guys where it seems that there may be somebody on his side just a little bit. You think? 
I think a lot, actually. Yeah, well, that's a good question. As we go through, this is an incredible, like, like getaway scene while you have these three, like, incredible assassins chasing him. And how much is Crocus's ability and knowledge of the terrain, like, Some. His, his own merits, and how much of it is the spinning coin helping yeah, him? Yeah, because there's a moment where he feels uh, a sensation in his leg. Hold on, hold on. We oh, never yeah. mentioned what he did with the coin that fell on the ground when the assassin took a shot at him. Well, he picked it up. <laughs> he put it in his belt. He put yeah. it. He slipped it between his belt and his clothing. It's resting right on his hip. Oh, that is true. Good point. As he's running away, the guy with the crossbow, the assassin with the crossbow, takes a shot, and it's right as a uh, impingement, a burning sensation in his leg causes him to stumble just a little bit. And as that's happening, the crossbow bolt uh, whizzes right past him. Whiz past. Uh, and then all of a sudden. His leg feels fine again. Yeah, it goes away right away. Yeah, right away. It was just enough to make him stumble. Yeah. That's I mean, right. He's running through buildings. He's running up staircases. He's going into his uncle's chambers. He's leaping out the window. I mean, he's leading this incredible goose chase, but he knows the terrain like no one else. Yep. I almost I, feel like uh, almost like a Pink Panther movie. Or yeah, something. sure. You know, sure. it's kind of yeah. a little bit comical. You know, oh, I'm I'm here where I know people, and I'll say something. They'll say something to me. They'll go, oh, like Indiana Jones, you know, where uh, where his father is like working on his, uh, his yes Bible passages. Yes, and then Indy's like, I gotta, I need help, you know, and he's like, uh -huh. say your Hebrew, say your Latin, whatever it was. And, well, he, yeah, yeah, he, he runs cool. up the yeah, he runs up the stairs, and he's, he's saying, "Hey, don't you?" There's kids up there in the middle of the night, right? And he's like, "Don't you kids ever sleep?" You know. And then he <laughs> runs through his uncle's chambers, and he has a tiny conversation with him, and says, "Hey, uncle," and keeps running. You're right. There's a little comedy there, but guess who? Guess who's pulling the street? This is an opon scene, right? Oh yeah. This is an opon scene. Well, it's upon pulling the strings of the coin, that's for sure. All right, so let me ask you a really quick question because, like, as he's down on the street from up above, he's back in a building, he's climbing up above, he leaves out through a window, and there's this scene where there's this cat. Yeah. And it shrieked, and a voice groaned out a single pained curse. Yes. We're going to find out more about that in a second, but that just seemed a little weird. The first time I read, the, well, okay, so the first time I read that, this chapter, I did not understand what was going on at all. I was totally confused. <laughs> so uh, there is another instance. It says uh, he was on the roof. He crouched in darkness. The burning sensation returned to his hip. And it's then when he reached inside at his hip that he realized that's the coin that was right there. Well, he got missed by an arrow there as well, or a bolt. Uh, he heard a whistling sound, and then again, another quarrel uh, went right by him. So three times. Three times uh, the coin has saved his life. Yes. So they are full in effect, the Opon twins here. All right, but let's be clear. These assassins that are chasing him are fully aware that an ascendant is helping him oh yeah let's get to that scene because that's amazing okay well i mean from the very beginning one of them says did you smell that right what really yeah. where show me Just third sentence down or whatever third line down so what 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 page 143 it's at the cold belfry the killer's oddly shaped eyes watched the thief scamper towards rooftop far side oh, yeah with a slight lifting of his head the killer sniffed the air then frowned a burst of power had just frayed the fabric of night yeah. like a finger poking through rotted cloth oh uh, yeah okay and yeah. through the rent something had come yeah and with that was a coin obviously um so they're aware that ascendant is playing in the game already so Crocus is going to get away from these killers, these assassins. And he's going to do it by dropping once again, basically on an awning that is on the top of an inn. The placard on the inn is a bird dead on its back, feet jutting upward. Yeah. And we find out that, that it's the Phoenix Inn. And Crocus is inside safe amongst his peers. Backed against the door. He has a lot of trust in the assassins not following him into that inn. Yeah, well, <laughs> feels like he's pretty safe in this situation. Kind of like Ichabod Crane crossing the bridge. So outside of the inn, we have a congregation of the assassins. First, the one with the crossbow, number one, and the one with the blades, number two, meet up. They know he's in there, undeniably. Right. 
they know he is in there. He feels safe, but they know. So the uh, first hunter asked the second hunter, what happened to you? I've been here basically all this time. <laughs> Where have you been? <laughs> and then the second one says that I had an argument with a cat. So let's go back to the scene where Crocus was running through his Uncle Mammoth's quarters, jumping out the window. Right when he was jumping out the window, he heard a cat growling, screaming, whatever the cat does. And then he heard a person fall into the courtyard down below, and he heard a single curse. <laughs> A pained curse. A pained curse. So he <laughs> literally got attacked by a cat, which knocked him off the roof. Pretty lucky. Well, so is he lucky or is this Opon again? I would, I'm going to go for Opon. I'm going to go with Opon also. <laughs> That's part of it. No, but I think he was leaping to a tree or something like that. And if he leapt to a tree, he's vulnerable. And that assassin I, was right on top of him. Yes, yes. Waiting to shoot. They were waiting. They, they knew. They knew he was going to come out in the courtyard they knew the preternatural ability of these guys is beyond the pale right? almost supernatural he no no definitely supernatural he could not have escaped these guys without the help of well, and that's what they were saying they were like and that's the really cool part when they were meeting at the end what did they say they were like the other someone agreed. interfered he said all in all to awry to be natural he, logically, they knew, even if they didn't sense it, they knew. Coincidence was way out of out of sync here. And it's uh, and it's when number one and number two are like, "Hey, we're gonna go on in there, and we're gonna take care of all the people in the inn." And that's when the commander shows up and is like, "No, we would rather have someone alive to talk about what's going on." Well, just to spread the rumor, you know, that the right. assassins are assassins have been, are being killed this is the beginning of the war like the word spreads that the assassins are after each other that's right and then they are not going to kill crocus or the people in the inn right now but it is questioned who was the ascendant that was uh, becoming involved and what is the answer someone with a sense of humor look at page 93 and look at Tashrin's description of Opon. He says, the spinning coin ever echoing. There's the jester's humor in the shaping. Yeah, he's the jester. We get that. Well, there's your or sense they of are. humor. Yeah, I thought it was great. I don't know. There's one more part in here that I don't think we emphasized appropriately. When they were taught, they mean they knew that a god was meddling, right? They knew. But they were so nonchalant about it. And he's like an ascendant, meddled. Too cautious to show itself fully, however. And the other one said, unfortunate it's been years since i killed an ascendant oh my god like they have killed gods well certainly the guy with daggers has and this 17 year old kid got away from these people right with the help of a god or an ascendant at least. yeah that's true but they're just like nonchalant about it yeah sure you know it's been years since i killed a god that's cool it's like oh you know and it is a sense of humor i mean after all a cat a uh a hurt hip you know, a bending over as a coin falls. These are all humorous things that when juxtaposed with something very deadly is humorous. Yule, that's awesome. Like, I honestly didn't get it until you put it all together like that. Yeah, you're right. This is completely some silly adventure scene that I just, I, while still being incredibly serious. Yeah, it's kind of like the Pink Panther. You you're can, right. You can hear the music, right? Bum, bum. Okay, so who are these assassins? Because they're not city assassins. They don't belong in Darujistan. These and are we, assassins that we've seen before? Have we? Or at least by rumor, right? We've heard about these guys. They've been killing sorcerers in Pale? Is that what it was? No. Those were the Claw. Oh, shoot. Okay, very the good. Claw the Claw were in Pale killing the Wizards of Pale. And then there was another group of people who've been all over the front killing claw. the Claw. <laughs> and these are the guys that have been killing the Claw. So we're talking about the Tistadur? Tisti Andy. Damn. <laughs> the Tisti Adur or the Gray? The the gray. Yeah, they're the shadow. They're the uh, what they, they've been mentioned, but they have only been mentioned as oh, they're the cousins of the Tista uh, Tist Andy. Tisti Andy. So how do we know that these are the Tisti Andy? They had eyes that were oddly shaped. Right. So that was one thing. Well, who else has oddly shaped eyes? Like, where does that where does that trail lead? Who else have we met that's uh, part Tisty Andy? 
Uh, what is that? Animator Rake? No, no. Nope. Um, He's full blooded. The guy that always wears green. Topper. Topper. Topper was described as having strange shaped eyes, and so were these guys. Is Topper black? I don't know. He's never described properly. Okay. But he might be. But the Tisty Andy are. Yeah, they're dark okay, skinned with white hair. Sure. I like, well. like to reiterate that because that's something that I lose after a while, especially on first time reading. For those of you that have watched or read mainstream fantasy books, these would be drow elves. Is that what it is? Yeah, essentially. That's what they look like anyhow, but they're very tall, like six and a half feet. So they're kind of like part Tolkien, part TSR or something like that. Sure, sure. Okay. All Erickson. All Erickson. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I, I I don't think we can underemphasize enough that every single one of these guys is is still BA. beyond comprehension. Well, you mean Krupp? <laughs> well, Krupp in his way. I meant the Tisty Andy. Yeah, I'm just joking. Uh, though there was one other thing I wanted to mention uh, when Crocus was running through his uncle's den or library, whatever it was. Yeah. Uncle Mammoth had on his shoulder a small winged monkey. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, if I remember correctly, we're going to see these things later on, right? Yes. I okay. know. <laughs> it's funny that you mentioned that because I like there's very few things I remember, but I think it's like book four that you finally meet these creatures. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. That's a that's really a, a neat little thing that Erickson does. I mean, everything is thought out, or at least it feels like it is. You know, sometimes it's accidental, I'm sure. But I, Like I said, I love the color. I love the detail. I love the world building. But I got to ask a question. Why are the Tisty Andy here? Why? I was wondering the same thing. Why are they killing assassins? Yeah. I don't know. Well, the Darugistans are trying to deal with the Malazans. Do you think that would have anything to do with it? I don't know. The, the because if the council during the daytime is trying to deal with the people that are invading, well, how somebody remember, at night is having, you know, is trying to sow some sort of problems within the city, well, maybe that's what's going on. Well, here's here's my shallow interpretation is that the Tisty Andy literally are creatures of the night, right? Creatures of darkness. And the assassins in Darugistan were the creatures of the night. And they were the only people that controlled the roof. I mean, the Tisty Andy are fighting to control the rooftops, no matter what that is. Why? I this don't is, know. This I, isn't their city. They haven't been here in yeah, thousands of years. Like, I don't know. But no. it seems to me that, I mean, they're killing people on the rooftops indiscriminately. Well, is that true? Well, well I don't know if it's true. I mean, they're, they picked out tallow right for what reason I they don't know. said that they were starting a war right or that's the in, that was the uh the interpretation of tallow that that was going to start a war and Maybe. i think that crocus thought the same thing so i think that we can assume that that's kind of the purpose is to create a conflict that takes care of itself so they can step in cause a problem that goes and snowballs and gets out of control and, and they don't have to do any work and half the assassins die maybe it's a distraction the thing is is that the commander tisty andy is okay with crocus being alive because crocus knows that there are assassins out there causing problems crocus also knows that they're not human so all of this information that he knows, if it gets back to the right people, they're going to be very happy about to see Indies. Explain. Well, if they want him alive so that he can let people know and he goes blabbing about it, I guess that's important, right? It must be. It must be. I mean, it suits their purpose, obviously, or they're not going to be doing it, right? But right. I, it's not revealed yet. We can only speculate. Well, I'm going to speculate so that people know the next chapter is going to have a lot of intrigue. <laughs> Good stuff, right? <laughs> oh, a lot of this will play out in that. Hey, sorry, I think you're right. I think you are correct. It says we leave no witnesses to this secret war with the guild. War with the guild, not creating the war with the guild. War with the guild. There, it's a battle for supremacy. Yeah. Well, okay. This was a really short chapter. I think a lot of it was not presented to us in this chapter, and we can only guess right now. It's a nice little establishing chapter. We know 
a little bit about the city. We know how it operates. We know the main two or at least two or three main characters that and are we've heard about some others we've heard about some others and uh we have a nice little foundation that as we go in deeper it's going to start playing out big time oh yeah. yeah and we haven't seen a malazan in this chapter yet no or, or, right or in this book yet yeah. not a single familiar face in this chapter nope it's difficult to go and scene change immediately in your very first book and have brand new characters yeah. that don't seem, yeah. I mean, we know that Malazan is coming to town, <laughs> but it doesn't seem at the moment that these are related events. Even though we know they are, it doesn't feel like it as you're reading it. Yeah, It sure. just, again, throws you right into the situation and you're supposed to absorb it and accept it and take on. Right, and there's no hand feeding, just like the last time. However, for my two bits, like seriously like this chapter was the chapter that got me into the book yeah only 135 pages in <laughs> there's a lot of great characters we've seen already uh you just don't realize it until you read more of the books but you know crocus is a recurring character for at least a while you know mm -hmm. ganos is for at least a while a lot and, of bridge burners you know a lot of the bridge burners a lot of you know krupp is going to be there for a while the gods or the ascendants and all that stuff. And we're just getting little pieces of them right now. And then they're going to grow and you're going to reference this book. And this is like such an awesome building block to the entire series that it's not, I feel I've watched a lot of reviews on it. It's not as well respected as I feel it should be. More fool them. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I agree. Okay, but you know, just a, w one more statement. Yes, this is an awesome book. But once again, Stephen Erickson does what he always do. He introduces you to an awesome character. He names him, and then he dies immediately. Who Tallow? Are you talking Tallow? Yeah, Tallow is pretty sweet. Impressed by Tallow. It doesn't matter. The point is, he, he he named him. He was awesome. He had this elaborate scene. He built it all up. I mean, he didn't shorten it. It was pretty short. No, the scene itself was short, but he didn't skimp on the details and the thought processes. I mean, if any yeah, exactly, I'll I'll agree with that. See, the way we presented it was a little bit different, but the, we had the long drawn out everything about Crocus without exception, except <laughs> the way he looks. You know, we got all the information. We know he's seventeen. We know he's seen naked ladies. We know he's seen prostitutes. We know he's wise. He's a thief. He's been doing this stuff all this time. But as far as Tallow, we know all that situation about him also. He's in the Assassin's Guild. He's roaming. He's doing this for, you know, all the reasons that he's done it. And then he's also in a situation where he's on the run for his life because he's been shot. And, you know, no skimping, like Philip said, on detail is there, just like Crocus. And if you read them side by side as they're coming out, you don't know which character is more important. Tallow could have been the one to live and Crocus could have been the one to die. You wouldn't have known until you read it as it was happening. And I think that's cool also. Yeah. But we did get a named character that died just like that. Boom. Right. Like, I mean, I'm kind of spoiling saying we're going to get more Crocus. I'm not telling you how much more. How Crocus dare you? Get. But, you know, it's not forever. Nothing is forever in these books. Yeah, not even Ascendancy. Exactly. Like, seriously, you guys thought George R. R. Martin was bad about killing off characters? Who? Oh, yeah. And, and the torture that these characters are going <laughs> to. <laughs> oh man i can't wait to talk about it someday okay so that winds up chapter five pretty well i think we might have even driven it into the ground a little no bit way. What? we'll so edit it down to talk about no it's true enough whatever oh, it was a good good one i think hey, but i'm i'm really grateful that it was short you better do it be justice honest. you better do it justice because this is my favorite chapter to date so therefore i will do it justice I will. Whatever. I'll do I'll do the best of my ability. How's that? Oh, but do we have to do a closing? Yeah, we need to do a closeout. I kind of reread that passage a little bit. Which one? About being the war with the guild. Yeah. They have initiated a war with the guild, but I think you are correct. They're doing it. They're working smarter, not harder. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're creating a war within the guild so that all they have to do is come in afterwards and clean up the tattered pieces. Let now, the guild kill itself. Yeah, yeah. Let the guild kill itself. Yeah. Because they probably don't talk. 
all that much, right? Well, different clans, yeah. Well, if they're if they're divided into cells, then they're not communicating a lot directly. You know, they probably all take orders from the top and don't spend a lot of time talking. Or they make assumptions. Who knows, right? Yeah, whatever. I don't know. No, I think you're right. I think they have started a war with the guild, but they're doing it by creating a war within the guild. See, I don't remember, and I'm glad I don't remember, because if I remembered reading this book, I don't think I would enjoy rereading it nearly as much. And I'm Why? having a good time. Well, because it's all spoiled, right? And right now it's not spoiled. Like I'm reading it as if it was the first time. It was so long ago. Were you guys cognizant of the fact that you were missing vast tracks of this book the first time you read it? Oh, yeah. Big and then I put it down and I had to reread it again because yeah. of that. Right. Well, but here's why. Most authors just create vast amounts of like meaningless fluff. Yeah. I mean, I, d I don't really agree. There's, I mean, there's, there are authors that do that, but that's not most authors. I, this well, guy does the fluff, but he does it in such a way that you don't realize that it's important. Yes. And right. that's where it's different than almost anybody else. I really feel. I wouldn't call it fluff for him, though, honestly. No, it's not well, fluff. All right, all right. Look, very, it's... very precise with his language. No, no, no. But listen, listen. And his planning is impeccable. From the wharf sprawled along the shore of the lake, upward along the steppe tiers of the Gadrobi and the Daru districts, among the temple complexes and the higher estates to the summit of Majesty Hill, where gathers the city council, on and on and on, the torches marking the more frequent and alleyways and hollow shafts that important stuff, not really. Dude, in, in two paragraphs, in two paragraphs, he explained how the city's laid out, Dude, how it's wrong. governed, and how it is illuminated by don't gas. Don't get me wrong. What I'm saying is that it feels at first, as you're reading it, you're kind of like, oh, this is just a uh, your normal, everyday, typical fantasy book with all this information thrown in. And then you realize later on, holy f I don't know what I just read because I was lost and I was entranced in the in the, the pattern da, 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 of a fantasy novel, not realizing that this is important. The beginnings of his paragraphs or um, chapters a lot of time, they don't, they don't do it for me. Like I have to reread the beginnings because I kind of have to get into it a little bit. I agree. Well, the point is, I think is uh, Yule, Yule is completely correct. There are th some things that are seemingly fluff, but and they're also incredibly meaningful. Both of you are mentioned it, but the point is, yeah, like I, the first time I read this, I skimmed over vast amounts because I thought it was fluff and I hate it when authors write fluff. And if you make that assumption and you read, skim through this, you're losing the gold and the luster of yeah. this book. All right. Well, that, that winds up chapter five which was gracefully short. We're gonna come back for chapter six soon, which is much longer, right? Yeah. It is, but it didn't. It's, how long did this just take? This was an oh. hour and a half. Yeah, but, there was, it, but, it's, <laughs> but it, there's so much there. It's a new chap, it's a new book, essentially. It's a new scene, it's a, it's a new context. Oh, I'm not, I mean, yeah, I agree with you completely. I agree with you completely. A lot of character but introduction. We're gonna get more too. Well, it's yeah, not over. we will get more, that's fine. But the point is you had to interrupt and do justice to the characters that were being introduced in this section. Right. And that takes time, which is the mistake we made the very first time we ever attempted this book. Where... Which no one will ever know about <laughs> yeah. because we didn't keep that recording. <laughs> no, we did not. That's right. That's right. Aren't you glad we did the Black Company first? <laughs> oh my God, yes. We learned valuable lessons there. We did. Okay. But thank you all for joining us for this episode. Follow, subscribe, and etc. And all the ways that you normally do to support a podcast or a YouTube channel or whatever. Sci-fi and fantasy read along. Um, join us for the next episode and yeah, we'll see you then.